conversation is obvious to me. But we've got a rock star on our hands with, uh, with this big turnout tonight. Uh, Evelyn Dueck is the newest member of the Stanford Law School faculty. Uh, but more than that, she is. First Amendment and social media and all things related to that. And she's one of the most uh, perceptive uh, commentators on social media. And uh, uh, let's see, she, she, uh, let's, uh, she did her law degree at the University of New South Wales, uh, a PhD in law, I did other were such things, and, uh, at Harvard Law School and has been a senior researcher at the Knight Foundation for the First Amendment a lot more recently. But uh, uh, tonight she's going to be talking about banning TikTok. And uh, the way this proceeds, she's going to be speaking for however long she wants, 20, 25, 30 minutes, uh, informally. And then afterwards, we'd love to have time for uh, questions that, uh, so just line up at the two microphones here and, uh, and have at it. So, uh, Evelyn Dueck. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, obviously, uh, a lot of people interested in this topic. That's very exciting. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, the growing movement, the uh, uh, sort of acceleration towards uh, more and more TikTok bans and the somewhat sort of belated uh, sort of uh, First Amendment considerations that they, they raise are sort of often uh, thought of as an afterthought in these conversations, which is uh, often interesting to me. But before I jump in, I'm actually really curious. Um, you, you might be here to see me or you might be here because you really deeply care about TikTok. And so uh, how many people in the room use TikTok? Um, have it on their on their phones as a as a user. That's a lot less actually uh, than, I, than I thought. Um, there's 150 million Americans uh, that that use it every month. Um, so they're not not in this room. They're uh, <laughs> they're watching TikTok instead. Um, okay. Well, then I'm, I'm curious then whether or not you use TikTok. Um, how many people think TikTok should be banned? I know that that's kind of, like, you might be here to actually find out the answer to that question, but okay. And then how many people think TikTok should not be banned? Okay, so maybe a slight majority, and then there are a lot of people who are, who are really just, just want to hear maybe um, what, what I think. Okay, so uh, the impetus for the talk um, is that uh, about 10 days ago, Montana became the first state to enact a full ban uh, of the, uh, or to pass a, a full ban of the app. Um, and Michael said to me, hey, <laughs> this seems really interesting and raises a lot of constitutional questions. Do you want to talk about it? So we threw out the old talk and, uh, and, and brought this one in because it does raise a whole bunch of interesting constitutional questions. Um, but the Montana uh, bill is uh, just the, the, the latest in, an, in a growing trend. Um, so there have been various types of bans uh, enacted around the world. Now, the vast majority of, vast majority of these are limited kinds of bans, so including uh, domestically in the United States and at the federal level, um, bans on having TikTok on a federal, uh, federal or official devices, um, so government-owned devices, uh, phones, um, some extend to public networks. So all of those uh, ones in, the, in, in America and then all of the ones in Europe, that's what those are. At the moment, they're just bans on having them on uh, official devices. Um, this map's a little bit outdated. Australia has also joined the club. Um, and then the, the uh, full bans, uh, the two countries that are there are uh, India and Afghanistan. And actually, China should probably be uh, yellow too. Um, but, but the vast majority of them are these partial bans, and then Montana um, has, has come out with this full ban. But Montana is not you know, uh, wildly out of left field here. So there has been discussion uh, of a full ban at the federal level as well. So uh, about a month ago in, in March, um, 
And the CEO of TikTok, Sho Chu, was on the hill. Uh, it was grilled for five hours. Notionally, it was a question and answer session to, uh, for him to talk about his app and everything that it's doing to protect uh, users' privacy and safety. But mostly, it was just politicians yelling at him, telling him why he wasn't doing enough to protect uh, users' privacy and safety. And I don't think anyone's minds got changed um, as a result of, of this uh, hearing. Um, so, so that was uh, in March. And uh, there has been this, uh, there's a couple of bills. Um, there's the Data Act, and then sort of the one that has the most momentum behind it is this bill called the Restrict Act. Uh, it has bipartisan support. It seemed to have um, uh, some momentum behind it. It seems to have stalled a little bit uh, in the last few weeks. Um, so I don't know what the status of, of that is or how likely it is to pass. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time today talking about the particulars of this act or exactly how it, it might work, because uh, I think that's far sort of less interesting, especially if it doesn't pass, um, than the sort of broader theoretical and general First Amendment questions that these, um, these bills raise. Um, but just to say that there is appetite for this. There are people that are thinking about this. This is not some, um, you know, uh, uh, completely um, theoretical thing. And in fact, you may be having deja vu because we have been here before in 2020, uh, President, then President Trump uh, enacted a, an executive order, um, issued an executive order uh, banning TikTok. Um, now that uh, that ban got uh, held up because uh, the courts found that he didn't have authority under IEPA, uh, the statutory scheme in that case. Um, and then obviously with the change of administration, that was let to lapse. But at the same time, he also banned uh, WeChat, um, which is another Chinese-owned social media app. It's used by a lot of uh, the Chinese diaspora. And so the, the TikTok ban at the time didn't reach the First Amendment questions because it was found that it just um, that Trump didn't have the authority to ban it. But the WeChat ban did re the, reach the First Amendment questions. And so there's a, a district court ruling uh, in the Northern District of California that uh, reached the First Amendment questions and found that it was unconstitutional because of uh, First Amendment uh, issues. So there is some judicial authority on this that can give us uh, some guidance as to how courts might think about this uh, when it comes. Now, I'm a little sad because uh, I had... Oh, oh, it is going to play. Oh, good. I thought it might not play. Um, okay, so how do we get to a place where an app that has this kind of content on it um, is, is being discussed to being banned? I mean, like, come on. I mean, are you serious? Like, look, look, we have to watch it all the way there. Is he going to, is he going to manage to, is he, how, what's going to happen to that last hazelnut? Is it going to, what, how's he, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh. Yeah, look at that. That's amazing. What an achievement. OK, so if you learn nothing else from this talk, it's the amazing cheap capacity of chip chipmunks. Um, OK, so how do we get to a point where like, an app that the vast majority of content is delightful stuff like this, or dancing, or whatever, um, it is, is being um, threatened with a ban? Well, there are two rationales that are generally offered uh, for, for, for this. So there are speech-related concerns and data privacy-related concerns. So the speech-related reasons, they generally sort of fall into three buckets. So the first uh, is Chinese censorship. So the idea being here uh, that um, TikTok will moderate, will remove, will deamplify, demote, bury uh, content that uh, is uh, contrary to the PRC's preferred political viewpoint. Now, uh, The Guardian got some documents a couple of years ago. There were some leaks about TikTok content moderators being instructed to do uh, basically that with re in relation to some content, uh, removing uh, content about Tiananmen Square, for example. Um, but TikTok says it doesn't do that anymore. There ha hasn't been sort of evidence about that uh, lately. Um, there's no sort of widespread evidence about that now. And also, you know, there are, there are there's plenty of evidence across the social media um, industry for apps bowing to political pre uh, pressure in various uh, uh, different uh, jurisdictions. So, so that's number one. Uh, the second concern is to do with uh, propaganda and influence. So the flip side of this, right? The first being that um, there might be Chinese censorship, and the second might be that, there, that this app might be a place the Chinese government might run influence operations. There are 150 million American users, as we uh, said, um, many of them young and impressionable, um, and that this, this app might be used uh, in order to sort of spread content, promote content um, that, that uh, 
uh, aligns with the Chinese government's point of view, or that even if it's not doing that sort of now, that it might in, that it could, that it might at a moment of political crisis or in a particular, on particular issues. Um, so again, no particular evidence uh, that this is happening now. We do know that the Chinese government uses social media uh, to run influence operations. It uses uh, most social media platforms to do this. On, um, Facebook and, and Twitter, um, but there's no particular reason to think that TikTok um, is being, you know, uh, complicit uh, in, in this um, in particular right now. And then there are general concerns about harmful content um, more, more generally. That this is a social media app and it has a whole bunch of stuff on it um, that, is, uh, that is harmful uh, to, to its users and we need to protect, uh, protect them. So, these are the kinds of rationales that are offered. They're not, um, you know, completely uh, uh, baseless. They're all completely sort of um, uh, uh, made up. This is the, you know, the FBI director has come out and said that uh, he's concerned about TikTok being used for influence operations. And then, you know, you can see these motivations uh, as part of the, the bill. So um, this, this is the Montana uh, piece of legislation. And uh, in the legislative findings, so it has a bunch of the other stuff that we're going to talk about. It has a bunch of stuff about the, the privacy-related concerns. Uh, but here in the findings, um, it says one of the reasons why it's banning this app is because of dangerous content. Um, and that includes it. There's this whole uh, list of things, uh, including uh, you know, lighting a mirror on fire and then attempting to extinguish it and uh, attempting to climb stacks of milk crates, right? Um, now, this may not be, like, this is, this is literally screen from the bill. I'm not making this up. This is, uh, this is in the legislation. Uh, maybe um, the first legislation to mention cooking chicken in NyQuil. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I, I, I can't profess to say that I think this is the most, like a list of the most democratically important content ever, but it's also protected speech, right? This is not uh, the kind of uh, speech that the First Amendment uh, doesn't protect. Um, if you could ban some of this stuff, you'd have to sort of ban a whole bunch of Hollywood movies um, when it comes to, you know, attempting to climb stacks of milk crates. Like, get, get that out of our children's faces. Um, so again, like a lot of this content, uh, not particularly... Uh, wow, that is very loud. Uh, <laughs> may not be the most, like, you know, self-governance... Uh, <laughs> promoting content you've ever seen, but that, the First Amendment protects that. <laughs> that is First Amendment uh, protected expression. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to these content or these speech related reasons that we might think about banning this speech platform, um, how's a court going to think about that? What is a court going to do when it comes to the First, first Amendment? Uh, and, well, the plaintiffs in the cases, so we're talking about TikTok users, uh, because it was WeChat users, for example, that brought the case in the WeChat ban case, or, the, or TikTok itself, that is, as an American company, has First Amendment rights, will argue, well, this is uh, a prior restraint of speech, so you're, you're preventing the speech from being, uh, from being uh, circulated, and it's, it, and it's content-based as well, right? You are banning it because you don't like this particular kind of content. And if that argument is accepted by the courts, then there's going to be a very, very high presumption against the constitutionality of that. That is exactly the kind of thing that the First Amendment says no to, that you can't have a government banning uh, speech or, or restricting speech or, or, uh, f because it doesn't like that kind of content, except for very narrow categories of unprotected content, uh, which is not what a lot of this stuff uh, is. Um, now, the government might say, no, 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 this isn't content-based. We're banning the entire platform, right? This is not a content. We're not saying we're banning this piece of speech or this piece of speech or this piece of speech. We're banning all of the content. Now, it's not a particularly compelling argument to say, this is fine because we're bringing a sledgehammer to crack a nut, right? Like, our, our concern is this bad content, but we're going to ban all of this extra stuff just in case. Um, so I don't know that that's a particularly uh, compelling argument. But let's say uh, it's accepted and the court will apply a lesser standard of scrutiny that we'd call uh, intermediate scrutiny. It still doesn't, that, that's not the end of the question, right? The court still will then scrutinize this under intermediate scrutiny. And it will say, well, that's okay, but you need to find 
<coughs> what you need to show us is that this is uh, serving a significant government interest. It's narrowly tailored uh, to serving that interest, and there's uh, plenty of other adequate uh, alternate channels uh, for users to speak. So then we get to this question of has there been a demonstrated governmental interest? And this is why it's quite important that a lot of the harms that we were talking about there uh, in terms of uh, censorship or um, uh, propaganda um, are, are not as we know, the, know in the, in the, uh, on the evidentiary record today uh, demonstrated. They're still speculative. And it's not enough for the government to come into court and say, no, 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 there are national security interests here. The court's going to say, the whole point is that the court's going to say, well, well you show us. <laughs> Show us something uh, that, that, that uh, can establish this interest. Um, we'll, we'll come back to that because I don't think that the, the propaganda related reasons are going to be the most sort of uh, compelling governmental interest that the, the, that the government might assert in these cases. But it, but it might be one. And, and there's this question of making sure that it's not purely speculative, that the court can't, uh, won't accept an argument where, uh, where the government just comes in and waves its hands and says national security. Um, the second question is going to be, well, is, is this narrowly tailored uh, to, to, to serving that governmental interest? And I mean, it's hard to argue that banning an entire platform is a narrowly tailored way of dealing with a particular kind of speech. Again, this is a sledgehammer and the nut. That doesn't seem a particularly uh, uh, fine tailored approach. Also, we know in other uh, circumstances where we've been, uh, where the court has looked at concerns about foreign speech, and we'll come back to this, or like propaganda and things like that, there are other kinds of things, tools that the court might say you should look at first, like transparency measures, disclosure measures, for example, uh, labeling and things like that, rather than complete outright bans, which are sort of a measure of last resort. And then there's going to be this question of, okay, well, what about adequate alternate, ch alternate channels? And here, you'll hear a lot of people saying there's no speech being restricted at all, right? Banning TikTok doesn't ban anyone from speaking. It just bans you speaking in this particular, on this particular app. But there's lots of alternate apps uh, that people can use. Now, this was uh, raised in the WeChat litigation. And in that case, the court said, no, that's not the case. This, this, is a, this app serves a particular kind of purpose. Now, a lot of that was actually to do with the particular characteristics of WeChat. So WeChat is a really important platform for a lot of the Chinese diaspora because uh, we, given that a lot of Western American platforms are banned in China, um, WeChat is one of the main ways in which they have to communicate with their families back home uh, and, and, and stay in touch that way. But I think we can think of uh, a number of arguments about why TikTok also has unique characteristics that are important to, to, uh, to its users, um, that there, you know, certainly many of its users don't feel necessarily that it's perfectly substitutable. It's also listeners' interests about hearing the, the, the speakers on TikTok that are not banned. The, like, TikTok's not going to disappear. TikTok's still going to be there, and there's still going to be people posting on TikTok in the rest of the world. And it's not substitutable. It's not enough to say, well, you can go and use you know, Instagram Reels, uh, because you were denying all of the 150 American, a million American users from accessing the speech of other people that are on TikTok. So it's not a perfectly substitutable product to say you can go and access uh, these other channels. So I think that when it comes to banning TikTok on the basis of speech-related rationales to say we are worried about the speech, I mean, that is sort of fundamentally uh, one of the things that the First Amendment really protects against, right? This is that is kind of the, the point of the First Amendment. It's going to be a very, very high barrier for the government to say we should ban something because we don't like the speech. Um, that's kind of what the First Amendment does. So, knowing that, uh, that's probably not what the government's going to try and do. So, the government's probably going to argue instead. No, 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 no. This is really about data, data, data. Um, <laughs> This is about privacy concerns, right? This is because uh, this app can uh, collects a whole bunch of information about you. Uh, it can tell um, your location. It has a whole bunch of things about you know, age, name. It's going to start to develop a profile about your preferences, your sexual identity, your political identity, all sorts of things, all of your interests, and, and, and uh, all of these things. This is, you know, they, the, the, these platforms can create quite a... Um, developed profile uh, of, of people. And the national security interest there of 
uh, the, the concern is that the Chinese government getting its hands on this kind of uh, data um, would be you know, a, a problem. It could lead to blackmail or recruiting, I guess, some of the arguments that we've seen, or just more generally, <coughs> intelligence gathering, knowing this much information uh, about um, Americans and, and American society. Now, the, there's some um, evidence of, of cause for concern about TikTok's data practices. Um, there was a story broken at the end of last year. Um, Forbes uh, found that um, employees in ByteDance, the Chinese company that owns TikTok, had accessed information about uh, uh, US journalists and employees in order to try and find out who was leaking information to employees. So Emily Baker White uh, was just like having scoop after scoop after scoop uh, about TikTok in, uh, in 2020. Um, and uh, employees at ByteDance started to try and work out who was leaking uh, and accessed uh, this data. Now, again, there's no evidence that this data ended up in the hands of the Chinese government. But the mere fact that this data can be accessed. Oops, I just slipped back. <laughs> data can be, I'm going to just, <laughs> it sounds weird otherwise, data. Uh, can be accessed by uh, employees in China, and therefore we know that ch the, the Chinese government um, uh, uh, can exert pressure and get access to that information as well. Um, that is a concerning change, right? And I think it's important to sort of hold uh, uh, two thoughts in our, in our head at the same time, which is one of these is like a lot of this is speculative and a lot of this is stuff that is also done uh, across the social media industry. Um, and so, and, and, and maybe there is some, uh, you know, xenophobia uh, motivating some of the concerns around this, but also to hold in the, the more complicated thought in our head at the same time and say, okay, but yes, there is some cause for concern here, right? That, these, that there's all of this uh, information being collected um, and a, a possible channel uh, back to the, to, the, to the Chinese government. Now, there's one small problem with the government saying this is the real reason that they want to ban TikTok. Um, and that's because, remember this, <laughs> right? They've kind of been telling on themselves um, in like enacting, no, 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 it's because of the milk crates that we really want to ban it. So the court's, the court's going to be a bit skeptical of, of a government actor that comes in and says, no, no, we're really worried about the data privacy um, because uh, so much of the conversation has been dominated by conversation, by uh, talk about um, the, 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 the content on the platform. Now, we might think that the next legislature that's not Montana might be a little bit more crafty and go, maybe we shouldn't put the unconstitutional reason in the legislation. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a genius. Um, so, so maybe the next time it won't be actually written into the bill. Um, but, uh, but it's also true that just generally the conversation has been, uh, like if you looked at the five hours of hearings um, with uh, Chu, um, you would see that a lot of it was uh, speech-related concerns. Now there's going to be questions about what is the court going to look at and, and a whole bunch of uh, things there that we can come back to. But I think it is going to be hard to get away from the argument at this point um, that a lot of this is motivated uh, about, um, about, uh, it, by concerns about content. Um, okay, but let's say the government does, uh, sorry, the court, courts do accept that this is uh, not motivated by the speech concerns, but motivated by concerns about the conduct that TikTok, um, TikTok's data practices, that it's the, the, and what the government wants to do instead is not regulate the speech, uh, but regulate the practice of collecting this much data and, and storing it in a way that is insecure and ac possibly, possibly accessed uh, by a, a foreign adversary. Well, there's going to be questions about, is that actually what you're regulating? Um, are you actually regulating that conduct when you are banning all of the speech? Um, and so that's going to be a question. Um, but if it is, if, if the courts uh, do sort of focus on this conduct question, that the, the, the speech, the, the regulation of speech or the restriction of speech is incidental to this regulation of conduct, then there's going to be a much easier test um, to, to, to satisfy. Uh, and and, and um, the, the incidental regulation on speech is going to have a better chance of surviving. Um, and the court will say, well, okay, you still need to show, however, that there is a substantial governmental interest. So we're still back to that. Uh, problem of, of, of demonstrating um, uh, the, 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 the concern. Um, 
we, we still have this problem of demonstrating that the concern is unrelated to the suppression of ideas. Um, and then there's going to be this question about whether uh, the restriction on speech is not greater than the essential, than is essential to the furtherance of that interest. So it's not narrowly tailored. It's not, you know, the least restrictive means, as some of the lawyers in the room will, these more stringent tests. But it's still, you know, you can't, uh, you can't uh, burn down a house to, to roast a pig. You can't, uh, uh, you know, completely um, ban far, far more speech or, or restrict expression far, far more than you would, uh, than you need to to achieve your aims. And here, there are real questions around whether, if your concern is data privacy, if the concern is about the, the practices and, and, um, and uh, the potential exploitation uh, of TikTok data, is this the best way to get at that concern? Is banning all of that speech um, uh, 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 going to, go, first of all, is it going to achieve that uh, fix that concern. And here we have a lot of uh, people will talk about data brokers where the Chinese government right now doesn't necessarily need to use TikTok uh, in order to get access to data about Americans. It can go and buy that on the market and from, from data brokers, um, just like the US government in fact does, um, and buys a whole bunch of uh, information uh, about, about people from those data brokers. So number one, you, you ban TikTok and you're still going to have the Chinese government being able to access data on the open market. Uh, and the second... Uh, question is, you could also do something else. And here, a lot of people are saying, enact a national privacy law, right? Uh, a lot of these concerns are about practices that are across the industry, this data collection, this data uh, 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 exploitation and uh, commercialization. And if we sort of regulated that practice, um, that, that we would get a lot closer to, to, to uh, addressing the actual concern that's underlying, uh, underlying these measures, and it wouldn't restrict speech in the same way. Uh, so that's going to be a compelling argument. Now, something that's been happening uh, in the background alongside all of this is that um, TikTok has been engaged in a, in a process with the US government uh, uh, to see if they can come up with an arrangement that, sh that is, uh, will satisfy the government about um, its, its practices uh, under CFIUS, uh, the uh, Council for Foreign Investment in the United States, and it's had this proposal called Project Texas, where it would house all of the data on servers in Texas, and it would be under the stewardship of uh, the American company Oracle, um, that would audit all of the code, including the content moderation code, and all of the data practices, and there's, there's, it's like a one point something billion dollar plan that they would have to try and demonstrate um, that this is a way in which they can protect data and privacy uh, without having to shut down the platform. This has been going on for some years now um, to try and, uh, uh, or I can't remember exactly how long, um, to come to an agreement that doesn't involve like divestment or doesn't involve a full ban. And, um, and, and the Biden administration has said that they're fairly unsatisfied with that process. So this has been going on for a while. Uh, and they've suggested that even with all of these different measures, that that won't quite show them, won't give them the assurance that they need um, that this data is safe. Um, and so one of the things that I think would be happening there is that through that process, the government would be creating an evidentiary record of the kind that I was saying we would need for a, a court to accept that there is some national security interest here and that there was no other possible way that the government could achieve its aim um, in, in doing it. So it's engaging in this long, months long process with TikTok to really see if there's another way around. And the argument is that the, the record that they're establishing there, the evidence that they'll be establishing there is they're going to come in and say, we really tried. We really did want to protect speech. We wanted to find another way around this, um, but we couldn't. And this is the, this is the only way in which we could, um, we could address these concerns. So, so I think that that's something, uh, and, and that by the way, was not uh, in the record that hadn't all happened when Trump uh, went to ban TikTok and uh, WeChat back in 2020. Um, so that, that would be something uh, uh, that would, would play into that. Now, another thing that, so, so I think you might be hearing from me some sort of skepticism or some sort of uh, First Amendment concerns. I mean, I think, I think we should be a little concerned. We should think that there are First Amendment concerns when you are banning an entire speech platform. Um, but one of the things that sort of makes me nervous um, is the First Amendment's record on foreign speech, 
um, which is not super great. Uh, so there, you know, uh, there are cases in the history, uh, in, in the case books, um, where the First Amendment hasn't been as sort of uh, protective of speech um, because when it involves cross-border or foreign speech, uh, as it might be for domestic speech. Um, so this includes um, uh, Blumen, which was a, a, a judgment of uh, Judge, then Judge Kavanaugh in the D3 District Court, that, um, so it was denied, uh, when talking about campaign um, uh, speech from, uh, of, of foreigners, um, uh, foreign citizens' speech right when it came to campaigns, that that could be restricted, and also famously uh, hold a humanitarian law project for, for uh, the uh, law students, um, or if you're interested, where uh, the court famously applied strict scrutiny to uh, speech that was uh, being given to these uh, foreign um, organizations that were listed on the uh, US government foreign terrorist uh, organization list um, that was not related to the terrorist uh, aims, terroristic aims of these organizations. Um, and it applied strict scrutiny, but it still found that the, that the ban on this speech uh, was uh, was constitutional. And so there's these moments where the court doesn't seem to apply strict scrutiny in the same way uh, when it involves these foreign, uh, foreign interests as it does when it involves domestic speech. So that's one thing I think that, that, that makes me, uh, I try not to take it personally, uh, that, uh, that the court isn't necessarily um, as, as protective as foreign speech. But that, 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 those precedents aren't all one way. Um, and there's another case um, which I think speaks quite well uh, to this moment. Um, so back in 1965, this case called Lamont, it was about a, a scheme where um, in order to receive what the government classified as Chinese propaganda in the mail, uh, you had to a, a confirm receipt for it in writing and, and uh, go and take a card that you'd written and, and get that. Uh, so you'd get that Chinese propaganda as the government uh, classified it. And so uh, <coughs> Lamont, Mr. Lamont, got this, car, uh, this card that said that someone had tried to send him the Peking Review issue number 12, um, and he could confirm that he wanted to receive it. And instead of filling out the card, he went and challenged this scheme in, in, in court this, uh, as unconstitutional. Uh, and the court said, yeah, that's unconstitutional. Even though it's not an outright ban, even though all it requires, you can still accept the propaganda if you want to, you just have to sign. This is going to have a chilling effect, because obviously at the time, I mean, who wanted to be like, yes, I desperately want to receive uh, what you have called pro communist propaganda. This doesn't feel at all chilling. Uh, I'm totally fine. <laughs> here, government actor, here is the record of me wanting to receive uh, Chinese propaganda. Uh, it's going to have a chilling effect, and that, that burden on speech was enough um, for the court to say, this is at war with the uninhibited, robust, and wide open debate and discussion that are contemplated by the First Amendment. And it's not that we're concerned about the, the speech rights of the Chinese citizens who want to send this propaganda. We're concerned about the, the listeners' rights uh, of Americans to receive and, and, uh, and hear this speech. Um, and Justice Brennan, in concurrence, uh, has this, what I think is uh, quite a nice statement to say, look, that the governments which originate this propaganda, that China doesn't have equivalent guarantees of freedom of speech, highlights the cherished values of our constitutional framework, and it can never justify emulating the practice of restrictive regimes in the name of expediency. And I think that, that you know, that comment reflects this sort of deeper question that we should ask ourselves when we're thinking about these TikTok bans, which is, what's the end game here? <laughs> Where does this stop? How does this go? Because TikTok is not the first and will not be the last uh, for a Chinese owned app um, that collects data. Um, there are other social media apps. I mean, WeChat will obviously be uh, the, the next um, concern. But there's other non-social media apps. I mean, if the concerns are, are data related concerns, I don't personally use Sheen. Is it Sheen? That where you buy uh, clothes, um, but that collects a lot of data about you, and it's Chinese owned. And um, uh, and similarly, what we'll see is like this trend. If the real, if that is the the, the true basis of the concern, what we're going to see is a trend towards. Well, what's the end game? Is it going to be creating an American great firewall uh, around um, around uh, American um, the American internet, such that there's no foreign owned or Chinese owned? apps. Um, and certainly that's not something that uh, the American government has generally sort of 
uh, condoned in the way that it talks about this on the global stage. Um, so right now on the American, on the State Department website, um, you know, there's this, this uh, page that is um, calling out the fact that China uh, currently bans uh, US social media platforms. Um, and for example, when Nigeria uh, last year banned Twitter uh, for a period, uh, again, um, the government called that out and said that uh, banning social media and curbing every citizen's ability to seek, receive, and impart information undermines fundamental freedoms. And there will be a huge loss of moral authority um, and the ability to make these kinds of statements and call out this kind of practice um, with, uh, I you know, if, if, uh, if America moves in the same direction. And it's not necessarily clear uh, to what end and for what gain, um, given the, con the, the, the things that we talked about, about uh, uh, sort of currently lack of publicly demonstrated harm, but also that the fact that there's all of these other, other fixes uh, that might be ways better, more effective, and more constitutional, and more in keeping with First Amendment values of getting at the same problems. Um, and so, uh, the so so you know, um, should think about that and uh, the um, uh, hypocrisy. Um, while okay, I'm bored in the house and I'm in the house. Uh, many uh, politicians house also currently I'm still bored. use TikTok. They should have a better reason bored for banning it than simply uh, I don't know that they're bored. In the house. bored. Um, okay. <laughs> That's all I have. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Hello, hello, hi. hi. <laughs> I am coming right now from two different seminars, one at uh, Hoover, that a Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna was there and talking about China. Mm -hmm. And then the next one that I went to about North Korea and human rights. And um, what I have seen during 15 years going to the seminar that uh, I am sure and certain and uh, Congressman Ro Khanna and Ambassador Michael McFall don't say directly, but I can see China is already won over US. US is not the superpower. And how China is working, and even if today China attack Taiwan, as I understood from this seminar, there is no enough uh, ammunition and stuff that US can do. And for me, just looking at TikTok and funny stuff that you say and First Amendment, not looking comprehensively what China is doing because I as an Iranian see that what uh, new colonialists that they are doing in Middle East and Africa, I think this is not a comprehensive uh, approach. I feel that we need to really cut uh, power of China in all aspects, in the soft aspect like TikTok and any other, and also in the military as Ro Khanna and other was mentioning, that we need to produce here. I don't mind if we... Awesome. Thank you for the question. Let's yeah. I mean, so I don't pr profess to be an expert in, in geopolitics. The only thing that I'd say is I think there's a lot of soft power in standing up for free expression and you know uh, the values of free speech that comes in being uh, uh, in reflecting those values uh, around the world, and that you know banning a, spe a speech platform may not necessarily be the most effective way of uh, achieving those goals. Just one day. Hello. Yeah. So thank you for the great talk, and I agree with you that TikTok should not be banned. Okay. Uh, one hundred percent. I am a civil libertarian, and I think that we will become like Iran if one day we ban the speech. Now, uh, the question that I have is the following. So, the way I understand it, uh, the US government doesn't have a problem with uh, Google is fine on everybody, Facebook is fine on everybody, Twitter is fine on everybody. Is the issue that the CIA, NSA, all these people don't have access to the data? That's the concern. And the question is, could that be a source by saying, okay, we don't have TikTok, but we require the minority Americans so that NSA and all these people can actually access our data the way the Chinese Communist Party says? So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you can just be honest. I mean, that's, that's what the issue is in America. Is that NSA and CIA? 
kind of have a little bit of the data that is useful for the past on Americans, especially because people are moving away from Facebook, Instagram, to TikTok. Okay, so the first, the, the First Amendment is where I see it. The Fourth Amendment is a little bit uh, outside my, uh, my wheelhouse. But there are all sorts of Fourth Amendment constraints over uh, the ways in which the, the US government um, can access data and the kinds of access information that they have access to in a way that, again, is not reflected. Can you always say that way? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I think one of the big concerns about privacy legislation has been about lobbying, about finding the. I, I don't. I mean, we have seen privacy legislation being enacted in the states. I don't think that the that that's the reason why we don't have privacy legislation. Uh, I think that the. I mean, uh, I think that um, this could be a unique moment and a moment to get. Yeah. So why, why don't we have a, so, sorry for the follow-up. Why don't why the European Union have a privacy legislation? What's the difference? So I think the problem is well, I mean, we don't get a lot of le national legislation in America in general. Congress is not the most well-functioning uh, legislative body, um, and this is this is a, a, a difficult thing to legislate. There's been a lot of lobbying uh, and uh, 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 efforts from industry to stop. Those measures, um, and so I think you know. I think that those are the kinds of dynamics I think that are leading to the, to the lack of privacy legislation. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Hi, Robbie. Hi. So I don't understand TikTok. Um, the, by the way, I may be the newest member of the uh, Stanford faculty, but Robbie is the newest tenured member of the Stanford faculty. <laughs> So, despite my lack of technological knowledge, so some of the one else have already uh, dragged me over my lack of knowledge of Instagram, and then I'll add to talk to this. Um, but I was really struck by that list of the harms, um, because that seems like an old-fashioned moral panic. Yeah. Right. Um, and I was wondering in terms of, like, how... Moral panics can be useful in terms of trying to curtail new things, yeah. right, on the backs of an imagined idea of children that's really sanitized away from messiness and violence and sex and all of these things, right? Like the like this imagined vulnerability of children can be used as a vehicle to put in sort of restraining regulations. So this seems like as Dungeons and Dragons, this is TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. like it's overseas. So can you like speak a little bit to yeah. that? Like is this something in which you see this in other sort of tech spaces that kids cooking chicken and oh, meal, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like is used to like ban a form for sure. So I mean, that is a huge part of this. So there is definitely a massive, like, won't you think of the children thing going on at the moment. And we have seen uh, Arkansas, and I'm going to forget the name of the other state that recently, if anyone knows it, they could, sorry? Utah, thank you. Yeah, Utah. Utah and Arkansas both recently enacted um, uh, uh, age limits uh, uh, for use of social media and that you have to register uh, your uh, accounts um, so that you can show that you're over 18. By the way, you can get a driver's license at the age of 16 in these states. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> just those 17-year-olds those that can drive but not use um, Facebook. They're really worried about them. Um, so, so there's a huge moral panic absolutely going on uh, with, with respect to this. And I mean, the, the, we know the First Amendment answer to that. We've seen it with video games where you can't ban this speech based on those uh, kinds of uh, harms. The First Amendment says, no, first of all, children have uh, speech rights and speech interests, and this is not the kind of thing um, that you can just go out and, and ban. So that, I think, is a, is a huge thing. I mean, funnily, just a fun sort of side uh, bar, that the, the Arkansas legislation in the thing that sort of seems to come out of Veep, the way that it's defined, what it applies to, no one's actually really sure. The wording is extremely unclear, and it seems like it might accidentally exempt TikTok uh, from its application. So it's going to mean that you uh, that you can't access it, uh, but, you, but you can access it in Arkansas. You can't ban. So TikTok will be the only uh, social media platform that the kids could access in Arkansas, potentially. <laughs> um, but yes, no, that is a huge part of what's going on here, is, uh, is that moral path. Thanks. Hi, Professor Jouet. Can you hear me OK? I can. My name is Divya, and I'm an undergrad studying computer science and political science. And I also happen to be a TikTok micro-influencer. So I do have some experience. OK. <laughs> so you would totally think we should bet. Yeah, obviously. I, yeah. I make money off of this platform. And so my question for you is, regarding at least the data that TikTok protects and has, 
I, I'm wondering, like, I make stand for, like, you know, what I do in a day videos. What is the government going to really do with that or the Chinese government? And so, like, the question to you is kind of basic, but what is, like, the real core of data that the government is afraid that the Chinese are going to have? And what threat does that pose to us in a national security sense? Yeah, I mean, this is what they're going to be have to demonstrate in court, right? Like, I mean, that's a very good question. That's exactly the kind of question that we should be demanding an answer to if, if with this kind of measure. I mean, I think you know, uh, being able to, I mean, I think the the journalist, the tracking journalists' uh, story is instructive, right? The reason why that gets pulled out a lot is because that's, I think, something that we would worry about, right? If we can track the location of journalists and where journalists are going and, and, and that the Chinese government might have access to that, I think you can draw out the national security implications and things like that. So it might not necessarily be you uh, that the government is super concerned about, uh, but it's the access to, to, to the, the, that it could be uh, anyone and certain people and, you know, uh, we, we, we don't necessarily, like, there are concerns about uh, using it to blackmail certain people. In certain, I mean, one of the reasons why these government device bans have been the first place to go uh, is because there's concerns about <coughs> access to data about government employees and knowing a lot about government employees and things about their lives uh, or, or, um, and their movements, which I think we can understand why that might be quite sensitive. Thank you. Um, I'm, I, I kind of wonder whether some of the uh, Constitution, the First Amendment stuff, is in more of a smokescreen way, in my mind. For it's, I think it's less a First Amendment issue than a corporate law issue. I mean, the the uh, TikTok could <coughs> create a U.S. subsidiary, minority control, license the software to the U.S. subsidiary, um, and have a big, you know, have a, you know, I think Oracle. They already have an arrangement with Oracle. Mm -hmm. to, to, to keep it, to keep all the data in the U.S. There are ways that this doesn't necessarily become a First Amendment issue at the, you know, the you know, first base is, it, you know, very, maybe the First Amendment issue is the third base. I think you really need to look, in, you should look at other alternatives so you can avoid some of the, some of these thorny issues because I think, I think to a certain degree this is a corporate control issue. Chinese want TikTok, and TikTok China wants to control it. And I have to believe that, uh, you know, they, they're kind of being hoisted on their own guitar because of what they did with those four people. I mean, yeah, I mean I'm that, sure. that started that whole congressional issue. <coughs> yeah. So in my mind, it's clear that there is a risk here. Forget about the guy in, this, in the, uh, in the, uh, but I mean, yeah. um, there, I think there's other issues here, and I, there is a simple solution that could that can avoid so, a lot of this. And I think it's a control issue, and it goes back to can we trust them? Because they, you know, if, if they really wanted to remain here without having congressional interference or legislation. There's an easy solution. So that's exactly what this CPS process has been about, about showing can we find other uh, ways of, like, as you mentioned, the Oracle plan, the Project Texas plan, of establishing different varieties of control and auditing and protections so that it doesn't get to, because so, I mean, I think I would totally agree with you. Like, let's not ban the speech, let's try and find other measures now. And, and I mean, there's been calls for divestment, um, and the Chinese government has said that it wouldn't be. Uh, wouldn't be uh, in, in favor of that. But I think that, um, I, I mean, I think that. You see, that's the great point. The Chinese government said they're not in favor, but therefore yeah. TikTok's not in favor. So it sort of shows an indirect, maybe not control. No, I mean, for, for sure. Indirect influence. Maybe Absolutely. Influence. So, no, I mean, there's no question. So the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese government has influence on uh, Chinese corporations, and Chinese corporation owns TikTok. That's absolutely for sure. Just on the, the fourth thing, I mean, it's also true that, I mean, this is a thing that we've seen in a bunch of other companies. So, I mean, uh, a Twitter employee uh, was found to be an agent of the uh, uh, Saudi Arabian government. This is like, there, there are a whole bunch of, like, underlying uh, problems here um, that, uh, that are endemic to these kinds of practices and things across the industry as well. So I think you're right that we need to look at other areas of law, corporate, corporate law, privacy law, things like that, uh, rather than necessary. Yeah, the US government, I'd emphasize that versus the First Amendment, because I think that's, that actually is a stronger argument why we need regulation. Yeah, I, I think we might be in agreement. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Sebastian. Um, 
I guess I kind of wanted to touch on like uh, uh, what the previous questioner spoke about, like a mistrust in TikTok, which kind of reeks of gross xenophobia to me because I don't trust Facebook with uh, Cambridge Analytica, th that scandal. I don't trust other companies with how they mishandled uh, uh, period tracker data since the yeah. Dobbs case. So I just wanted to say, uh, do you think uh, do you think if people start to advocate for banning of more platforms like YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, do you think that could stand up to legal scrutiny better vis-a-vis uh, -vis the First Amendment and national security concerns? So the argument being, uh, would the, if we say we're banning all platforms that, it, that use these kinds of data collection practices, so we really are targeting the conduct of this kind of data protection, and it includes American uh, platforms as well as Chinese platforms. Is that... Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, that would be a much more compelling argument for saying this is not like speaker-based or, or uh, targeted, uh, uh, that we are disfavoring a certain kind of speaker or a certain kind of platform or a certain kind of content. Uh, for sure, I think that that would be, I mean, it's going to have a whole bunch of other problems, not to mention political, I mean, we're living in a, in a, 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 a it's just not going to happen that there's going to be a ban of all of these uh, social media platforms. But I think you, the underlying thrust of your argument, which is that wouldn't that be a much more consistent position <laughs> that shows a much, like, a, 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 that this is the true concern and that we really are concerned about the data practices rather than the fear of, of Chinese propaganda or just sort of, uh, a Chinese company more generally, I think I, I totally agree with with you, and that's why this uh, there's there's uh, that's why bringing this argument to court, there's going to be sort of all of these reasons to say, well, you're saying it's this data privacy concern, but first of all, you keep talking about all the speech interests, and second of all, there's all of these other ways that we can get data through data brokers, and third of all, you're not actually fixing the data concerns. Like, you, there are there are other ways in which you can go. If this is your actual concern, uh, there are different ways in, in, in regulating those kinds of problems. So, yes. Thank you. Um, um, since one of your uh, to be here, um, uh, I think um, right now we kind of like talking about the government, but um, the government is actually the, uh, the relationship between China and the uh, US, right? I, I think one thing like probably we need to not think about is not, not just the, like uh, the government we choose, it's also about the business, right? Think about like TikTok is the new media, the new social media, which means it's, it's, a, it's a challenging for the oldest social media, as like Fox, like CNN, something like that. It's kind of like a challenging for the all the money is, you know. How, how do we how do we think about the the rule that uh, that the you know like the the lobbyist or like the uh, like the traditional media like companies? Uh, what kind of role they play in this event? What kind of role they play in, in this event? Like in like the TikTok ban, um, banning something like that. I think it's not just the TikTok threat, right? It's there's another. Um, so, you know, in the wake of the 2016 election, um, we had what came to be known as the tech clash, right? Um, where there was these, these companies that had been the darlings uh, of America. There was suddenly a massive turn of public opinion against uh, Facebook and Twitter and, 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 and those companies. Uh, and it sort of centered around a couple of things. Uh, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which has been mentioned uh, already. Um, and then sort of there was this feeling that it was the, the Russian interference in the 2016 election was associated with that. And I think sort of in the fallout, in the sort of like aftermath, a couple, of, a couple of years removed, I think it's safe to say that a lot of the old media reporting around some of those concerns was quite uh, uh, overblown about exactly what was going on in, in those certain, and, and, the, and the effects and dangers of certain kind, like, uh, you know, the effectiveness of Cambridge Analytica, for example, in, in what it achieved, or the effectiveness of Russian intervention. Uh, interference uh, in the 2016 election. And I think you're absolutely right that part of that, whether consciously or unconsciously, is that 
these uh, social media was eating these companies' lunch, um, and uh, and I think that well, that's certainly uh, sort of how a lot of people um, in the industry feel uh, about it. Um, so I think I think there is an element of that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks, Professor Duak. I, I learned an incredible deal as one of the few, I guess, non TikTok users in existence. I would always listen and wonder what the, all the hubbub was about. But now I know a little bit now more. You see the chipmunk video, you're like, oh, yeah, I no, am exactly. downloading so, it. Maybe uh, I might be inclined now to download it, you know. You know, if, if the government finds out where I live, alas, but... <laughs> but it's worth it, because you've got that last table about it. Yeah, yeah, you know. It's, it's so yeah. good. But, but j just real quickly, I wanted to revisit the, the question I think the professor brought up earlier regarding the, the question. So clearly, I think you pointed out poignantly that there are concerns with, re with respect to the regulating or banning of outright uh, platform speech. But how, how should we then think about, and I think that gets to the heart of maybe the Montana quip, the blurb that we looked at, is uh, how do we look at this with relation to the, the regulation of access from potential minors who, like, if you look at, I don't know, like, Locke's treaties, for example, do have a diminished idea of um, fr fr freedom of speech, for example, due to their, you know, the, the lack of reasoning capacities or others that might render a sort of ban that you sort of saw in Montana more acceptable? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, so we, we've been through this before as well. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, the sort of, well, the uh, sort of uh, big sort of uh, canonical First Amendment internet case is Reno is about exactly this, about restricting uh, minors' access to, to the internet. Uh, and it was struck down as un unconstitutional because it one of the main reasons is there's no really sort of like narrowly tailored way to restrict minors' access to the internet without sort of having all of, like restricting uh, adults' access to certain kinds of content and, and all of these other sort of collateral effects and collateral damages. Um, and that it's just not sort of uh, so narrowly tailored. So I think, I think what you're reflecting is there is this like concern and justified concern about, you know, um, uh, reduced capacity, like, you know, for children and, and um, child safety. Um, but I think the generally the way that the courts have thought about it, and this, again, we talked about video games as well, like, is that there are other ways of sort of trying to take care uh, of, of children and, and, and um, leaving as well also parental rights as part of that, as part of the parental role, uh, rather than sort of banning or restricting speech in certain ways. Thank you. Correct me if my memory is mistaken, but um, as much as I appreciate having my privacy respected, uh, how, does, how does that get reconciled with Samuel Alito's and the Supreme Court's, um, shall we say, turning your back on the, on the concept of constitutional basis for privacy about nine months ago? Yeah, uh, so um, different conceptions of privacy, I guess, that you're talking about the uh, conception of privacy um, uh, in, in in the due process guarantee. So this is talking more about sort of just, uh, I mean, I'm using it very specifically in the terms of data privacy and the concerns about uh, uh, location tracking and that kind of information. And this is not a constitutional right that I'm talking about. When I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the sort of colloquial term uh, and I'm talking about a call for legislation to protect those rights and enshrine those rights. So this is not uh, necessarily, this is not something that's gonna, uh, <coughs> It doesn't. In, it's the same word, but it's a false friend. So it's not exactly um, related to those constitutional issues. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. I uh, appreciate it very much. I do have a question. Do, do people in China have access to TikTok? Are they able to use it? Yeah. No. Uh, they have. Yeah. It, it, that, that's what did I say? I can't remember if I said that China should also have been yeah. yellow on the map because uh, they have a Douyin. Uh, is it? it the Chinese version of TikTok, yeah. It was actually really wild. I, what time do we, do we have time for a sidebar? What? Yeah, are you okay with going a little bit over? Okay, yeah, so I'll just a quick sidebar, uh, and then I'll let you actually ask your question. Um, but the, the, in, the, in this congressional uh, hearing with Xiao Chu, um, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, 
uh, lawmakers were, were saying, you know, like there's all of this stuff on your platform that isn't on Daoyin, the, the Chinese version of your app. Look, they're so much better at content moderation than you are uh, because they can get rid of all of this kind of harmful stuff. And it's just this like wild through the looking glass moment um, where there are these American lawmakers yelling at this, this man to say, why aren't you as good at like controlling the speech um, as this, this, this Chinese company. And the, the reason is because if you don't care so much about false positives, it's much easier to get rid of content if you don't care about getting rid of a whole bunch of other stuff uh, 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 alongside it that isn't problematic. Um, and so anyway, so yes, they don't have access to, to TikTok. It just strikes me that that's a good litmus test for their approach to mm -hmm. freedom and freedom of speech and rights and, and perhaps gives a signal as to what they would do with the data that they collect um, as compared to us, for example. I, I'm no apologist for the other platforms, yeah. uh, but by and large, they're you know, contained you know, within our country, and, and anybody in any country, I believe, can have access to it, provided their, that their country allows for it. Uh, it, just, it just seems that uh, you know, we have different standards. Um, you know, the French may have a different standard for the wine that we would import to them uh -huh. compared to the wine that we would import from them. And so similarly here, it seems like if they were to, they, the Chinese, were to grant equal access to their people to the products and services that they provide to us, then maybe that would be a better indication that, that they're playing fair. Yeah, I mean, I think, so this is an argument, uh, Tim Wu made a similar argument, I think that in the New York Times, I can't remember the co-author that he made it with, but basically, like, we're being played for suckers uh, because this is, you know, the, exactly the kind of argument that you're making. He's like, these principles are all very nice, but, like, wh what about this lack of reciprocity? Um, and so I think that there is, you know, some force to that argument. I guess I would just... I mean, but I'm a First Amendment person, and uh, to come back to the idea that, like, standing behind those values and standing up for the idea that, like, uh, freedom of speech is really important um, is, a, is a powerful tool um, in the geopolitical toolbox that's worth sort of standing behind. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a cliche to say, if you don't know what the product is, you're the product, right? And so uh -huh. I think that that's their attitude toward us. And it's saying Mark Zuckerberg, I think that, that's, all, that's all of them. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take one last question. Yes. So, I'm Alan Weiner. I'm probably the oldest faculty member. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, your, um, just one comment. Um, I mean, obviously, the concerns about data privacy are um, data security are incredibly important. But I think it's important to, to bear in mind that what we're talking here about is not data security is national security, right? So the exploitation of data by private US companies mm -hmm. is different from Thanks. the exploitation yeah. of data by a country that we believe potentially is a, you know, a geopolitical you know, national security rival. I don't take a position on whether that's yeah. right, whether that's a justification, but I think it's wrong to conflate Google exploiting one's data from China exploiting one's data. Question. Um, what's your view on the First Amendment of the constitutionality uh, uh, of the ban from, of TikTok from federal government systems? Much narrower, uh -huh. uh, uh, the, and I'll take my answer off here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's a really lovely way of putting it, by the way, about data security and, and national security. Um, I, uh, I try to be, get to that point about like holding these two thoughts in our head at the same time about sort of like the equivalence and the non-equivalence. Um, so thanks for that. I think that's a nice way of putting it. Um, so I mean, I think uh, I find that that's much more compelling and much more likely to withstand scrutiny for exactly like it has tried to do what exactly what a full ban does not do, which is like identify the national security risk and tailor the action to that risk. Um, and the restriction on freedom of expression there is quite minor. Um, the employee can go home and turn on their boot on their you know personal uh, uh, phone or laptop and, and use the platform. Uh, it's just very specifically concerned about these uh, uh, federal devices and things like that. Uh, so I think that that's much more compelling. One step removed would be these. Uh, there's, there's also been bans about public networks, uh, and so we've seen um, certain like public universities, for example, have banned TikTok from being used on their networks. So we've seen, I think, Texas um, might be one of the universities, and that is getting fishier for me, uh, particularly because there are like legitimate research purposes for uh, 
uh, researchers within these universities, academic researchers who access the platform for their research, and also you know all of these um, uh, collateral harms to, to people who want to use them. Who, by the way, it's just so ineffective also because they just switch to their data plan and then end up using the platform anyway. Uh, and so, I, so we're starting to get further away, uh, and, I, and I think that's exactly you know, the kind of thing that the First Amendment asked, right, is like, are you tailoring? And this is a, a good way of looking at it, is like, well, out here we have a, a full-on ban, here we have a federal uh, device ban, and like, can we at least try and think about some stuff maybe in the middle or other ways of getting around it rather than going from zero to 60 um, uh, straight away? Well, uh, thank you so much, Evelyn. Thank you for watching.